Hello and welcome to Stuff That Interests Me with me, Dominic Frisby, and I am very, very excited about today's interview. We're talking Bitcoin, we're talking cryptocurrencies. My guest is a great friend of mine. He's been involved in alternative digital currencies and have been writing about them since the early 1990s and he's central to the whole Bitcoin movement. He was CEO of the Bitcoin Foundation in 2012 and now he's chief economist with Enchain. He is, of course, John Matonis. John, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for coming on. Thanks, Dominic. Um, Another new high in Bitcoin today. Every day it seems to be there seems to be a new high. We've broken comfortably above five thousand dollars a coin. How big, John, can Bitcoin get? It, it, it is astonishing just to see that today on, on the way over here. It might have something to do with your program, so let's hope so. Um, we are just in taking baby, baby steps on how big this can get. Um, we're approaching a hundred billion in Bitcoin market cap. Uh, we haven't seen $100 billion worth uh, of, of Bitcoin as a market cap ever, so this would be a new high as well for Bitcoin. I think we're at about $88 billion right now. And the reason that people think it's big now is because there's a lot of zeros on the number. But what they fail to remember is back when it was $100, going from $100 to $1,000, or even from $10 to $100, those were 10x moves, just 10x moves. So for us to see a 10x move now from 1,000 to 10,000, or even in the market cap size, let's say from 100 billion, 10x would take, only take you to, to 1 trillion. It's entirely feasible, given the history of Bitcoin, that a 10x move would take us to a $1 trillion market cap in Bitcoin. Now, ultimately, this is going to reflect the amount of commerce that's done over the network, uh, because the, the, the price reflects uh, the amount of, of traffic that's being done over the network. Uh, this is what uh, provides the liquidity. In order to do the higher size value transactions, you need greater liquidity. So uh, I think it's, it's way too early uh, to, to call it a, a top. And if you don't believe me, go out on the street and just ask the average person on Oxford Street uh, if they've heard in, about Bitcoin, if they have a Bitcoin wallet. A lot of people have heard of it, but a lot of people don't have a wallet yet. Um, on that note, and you warn me, every time we talk I always get sidetracked, but there are people who, if this was another market, if this was a mining bull market or something, there are people who are buying and selling bitcoins and talking about bitcoins who you would say are green investors. Um, and normally when, you know, the equivalent of the shoe shine boy. And when people like that are uh, getting into a market, it's often a sign that we're at some kind of top. But it doesn't seem to apply to Bitcoin. Uh, it doesn't apply because we're, we're not there. Um, even to the extent that you see that, it might be FOMO, fear of missing out. Uh, but still, the, the, the wallet management to be able to secure your own private keys and back them up properly is, is still kind of geeky and techy. Uh, average people have, have not uh, gotten into this yet. Even though you see massive signups at, at third-party uh, online wallets like Coinbase, um, they're, they are instrumental in bringing in retail, but for people who are downloading their own wallets and backing up their own private keys, we are not there with the technology because it's not as easy to download as Skype yet. It's not as easy to operate uh, for the average person. So and it will be as easy as Skype one day? It, it, it will be, and you'll be able to do it uh, on your own uh, machines and on your own phone uh, in, in that easy way. So you won't have to always depend on, on these third-party retail brokers like Coinbase. What would make you sell your coins? I know you buy and sell coins all the time because you're a trader and at one stage you were paid in, coin, in Bitcoins. But I mean, what would actually make you a net seller? Well, I, I don't do any day trading in, in Bitcoin. I don't think it's, it's a commodity uh, that is suitable for day trading. Uh, it I, isn't. I, I think, it's, I think it's, long. A, <laughs> it's, it's definitely a buy and hold strategy. Um, uh, unless you're an arbitrager, uh, you could make money being an arbitrager. Uh, to be a net seller of Bitcoin really, though, just means that you don't have enough fiat to, to pay your bills. So in that regard, you know, sometimes you are a net seller of Bitcoin uh, inadvertently. But to be a seller of a substantial position of Bitcoin, you have to ask yourself, what are you going to be selling it for? Are you going to be selling it for fiat currency? And, and if so, why would you be selling it for fiat currency? Are you going to be selling it for precious metals? Uh, to get a gold position, and, and what's the rationale for exiting uh, Bitcoin, which is digital gold, 
uh, and, and going into um, uh, going into uh, analog Bitcoin, which is the physical gold. So you're basically saying there's no rationale to sell it because it's going to get so much bigger. Well, it's a philosophical change of mindset. Is you're not sitting there and looking at your uh, British pound bank account, you know, in in HSBC or Barclays, and trying to increase that balance. You're, you're holding your, your, the majority of your funds in Bitcoin, and you're spending them as you need to spend them. So there's really no exit event that you're looking for because the new money for the new economy uh, is cryptocurrency, and it is Bitcoin. So it's a transitional mindset. When you have that transitional mindset, then you don't fall prey to these um, uh, bouts and periods where you feel like you have to sell. Is crypto going to replace fiat? Uh, not immediately. Uh, it will challenge the fiat issuers at first, and they will coexist uh, side by side. But for Bitcoin to replace fiat, it would have to attain the final and third phase of money, uh, which is the unit of account function. Bitcoin has store of value, it has medium of exchange, and the third function of money is unit of account. This is when you see goods and services start to be priced in the, in the numeraire, which, which would be Bitcoin. We are a ways off from that because you don't go into the store and see uh, the things priced in Bitcoin. You mentally calculate it based on what you see the fiat price. So uh, we're a long way from, from that phase. And in the meantime, it's just going to be causing a lot of headaches for monetary issuers, especially monetary issuers like Venezuela. Are, are central banks going to have to, are we going to start seeing blockchain-based fiat currency, if you see what I mean? Well, we've, we see attempts of it all the time in the news, but uh, we, we shouldn't be inspired by that. Uh, you know, the, these attempts uh, are, are a little bit funny because, first of all, they won't be uh, decentralized. They, they most likely will not have uh, permissionless mining. And most importantly, they won't have a cap of issuance. I can't imagine any central bank that's going to agree to, a, to an issuance cap. It, it, it violates what, what they exist for, is to have uh, the ability for, for unlimited issuance. I think it's more likely that we'll start to see Bitcoin uh, in the reserve portfolio of central banks. Australia has, has indicated this. So that means that alongside of uh, dollars, euros, yen, uh, they will hold Bitcoin in the reserve balance sheet of the central bank. Now, if, if a central bank did, were to do that, they would be able to issue currency that is partially backed by Bitcoin. Are you familiar with SDRs? Yes. So just quickly to the viewer who doesn't know what, what SDRs are, they're special drawing rights and they're an invention of the, the IMF and they're almost like one SDR would be made up of something like, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it would be something like 50% dollar, 30% euro, 10% yuan, 10% yen, and 5% pound, something like that. In other words, it's a basket of fiat currencies. Will we see, and a lot of people at one stage were lobbying for gold to play a role, to be, to be part of the makeup of the SDR. Do you think we'll see crypto play a role in the SDR? Uh, we, we might. I mean, if it's suitable for a reserve currency basket, then it would be suitable for uh, something like an SDR. I just don't think that the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, has that much of a, of a role uh, going forward. Um, there, there are substantial implications of when we migrate uh, to a crypto economy or, or a post-legal tender age. Uh, the monetary policy is taken away from the central bank issuer. So they have nothing to do. They end up with empty bank towers. If the IMF had to, f uh, had to invest its funds based on its predictions, it would long since have gone bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, let's talk about... Now, one of the things we're seeing now, and it's, it's incredible how quickly this has happened, is the ICO, initial coin offerings, the kind of crypto equivalent of an IPO. And these... They date back a few years, but the, the tide has really got moving since maybe the spring of this year. Right. And we're seeing, you know, $80 million raised in five minutes for some new offering. And everyone is saying they're a bubble. Now, I, I, one of my definitions of a bubble is a bubble is a bull market in which you don't have a position. <laughs> so true. <laughs> in other words, uh, oh, I'm not invested in that, therefore it's rubbish. Um, why aren't... ICOs in a bubble? First of all, ICOs, I want to say to the Austrian economists and, and, and libertarians who are a little bit down on ICOs because uh, in some cases even calling for regulation. Um, but ICOs represent pure, undiluted, unlicensed capitalism. 
it's, it's, it's caveat emptor situation. You have to do your own research and you have to become an intelligent investor, not a lazy investor when you're investing in these. Uh, we are only, uh, I would say, five or six months into you know, the, the ECO or ICO boom uh, that, that started earlier in 2017. In fact, I went to a conference in St. Petersburg, Russia, which was about ICOs. And underneath the uh, conference was a statue of Lenin, you know, the famous Vladimir Lenin uh, uh, statue. So people are doing ICOs in Russia under the statue of Lenin. <laughs> and, and, and capitalism is coming there. And you, we, we shouldn't shy away from this because it's another form of fundraising. Um, and it, it hasn't been, um, it hasn't encroached enough into traditional private equity or into VC yet to, to even come anywhere near uh, calling it a bubble. So that's why I disagree with that statement. But but, uh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, aren't some of the companies that are raising money fraud there, scams? The, there's no question that companies are raising a significantly more amount of money than they actually need or even know what to do with. Um, uh, on the issue of some of them being scams... Um, Where's the money coming from? Is this just Bitcoin profits being rolled into ICOs? Or? Oh, Bitcoin and Ethereum profits. People who want to diversify from Ethereum holdings, because a, a, a large amount of these investments are going through uh, Ether. Uh, some of them are going through Bitcoin. Some of them are going through Litecoin. But yeah, it's a diversification of people who made uh, money in crypto. It's institutions actually getting in on a pre-sale so, uh, so that they can benefit from the, from the public ICO sale. Um, and so it's not necessarily dollars going into crypto, it's cryptos kind of rolling further down the road, if you like. In some cases, it provides demand for the, for the crypto coins to be able to get in there so that they can participate in the ICO. So in, in some cases, that's what's going on. But I, I, will, I will venture to say that uh, the percentage of failures that you see in the VC startup world, traditional VC startup world, is, is not going to be much different than what we see in the ICO world. I mean, they, they, they have a, a 3 to 5% hit rate on success. Yeah. So, uh, sure, we see a lot of failures in that world. We'll see a lot see of failures in, in the ICO world as well. Okay. I mean, crowdfunding ventures often fail as well. But, uh, look, look, I can tell you what's driving it, though. What's driving the ICO market is that, um, uh, first of all, investors don't have a lot of rights. They're not purchasing equity in, in, in a lot of cases. In some cases, they are, but, but not in all. But what's driving it is the investors notice that they can get um, a, a very rapid return because of the liquidity on the secondary market for these tokens. They can also get in at smaller amounts. So retail investors can get in where sometimes they're uh, prevented from participating in a larger IPO. And these tokens act as digital bearer instruments. So they're like digital bearer bonds. You can invest in these without um, uh, w w without uh, you know, full, uh, fully revealing who you are. How many have you done? I've participated in four. Okay. And when will you know if they've come good or not? Uh, we'll, well, we'll know very quickly in the secondary market for these tokens. Uh, just uh, yesterday, we announced um, uh, one that I'm participating in with a digital currency exchange called Globotex. And uh, Globotex is uh, attempting to uh, bring the digital currency into the real world physical commodity market. So we'll be trading physical commodities uh, for, uh, for Bitcoin and for Ethereum. Uh, we'll also introduce uh, a derivatives market. So we'll have uh, futures and options for risk management and, and corporate hedging. Okay, let's talk about some of the applications of these ICOs. Let's talk about some of the applications of blockchain technology, the future uh, over, say, the next... I mean, how far advanced is blockchain tech? What kind of things is it being used for? How quickly are we going to see these materialize in our kind of day-to-day -day lives? Where are we and what are we going to see? Well, we're, we're seeing a lot of pilots and we're seeing a lot of uh, proof of concepts at uh, the larger financial institutions. So not anything in a production environment, at least uh, with respect to the, to the larger banks. So a lot of experimentation going on. But we, we're, we're starting to see uh, good uh, inroads being made into the global remittance market. So there's apps that you can use on your phone. Uh, uh, actually to, to, to send money to other people who have that app. And uh, the one I'm thinking of is uh, an app called Abra. It, it operates like Uber uh, for, for ride sharing, but Abra is, is an app that you have on your phone for exchanging in and out of Bitcoin. Uh, you can go any country to any country uh, once they uh, roll, roll out the service to those other countries. We're seeing great applications in online gaming. 
the online gambling market uh, is, is always one of the industries that gets exploited with, with new technology. Uh, and it's a great fit with, with Bitcoin as well because you remove the problem of, uh, of the payment provider uh, in, the, in the unregulated gaming markets. Um, then when you go to Ethereum, you're seeing uh, you know, incredible innovation around the smart contracts. The ERC-20 uh, sub-protocol with, within Ethereum is what's responsible for all of these, these new crypto tokens that are being issued through ICOs. Um, and you're seeing a, a flourishing a, of activity on uh, you know, what we hope to see in the future on that, um, in the P2P lending market especially. So can you give me an example of something that we will see in our everyday lives in, say, five years' time? We'll, we'll start seeing... Uh, things like when you rent property or when you purchase property, when you own property, you, you will be able to, because of uh, blockchain technology and cryptographic protocols, you will be able to subdivide your ownership in a house uh, or your ownership in a, in a flat uh, to be able to open it up to wider participation. So you might only be the 20% owner who's living there, and instead of getting a traditional mortgage, you've essentially crowdfunded uh, uh, the rest of your mortgage. These things are, are uh, on the verge of happening, and they're already in the planning stages. Uh, a company in Camden uh, is, is starting this. Okay. Now, a lot of people say Bitcoin is, you know, we're in the 1990s, and Bits, Bitcoin is Netscape Navigator, and Google hasn't been invented yet. You dismiss that argument. Uh, I dismiss that argument just as I would dismiss it for being the MySpace uh, Facebook argument. Okay. Uh, and, and, and it relates to protocol battles. Um, those are social media platforms. Uh, and what we're seeing with Bitcoin is a protocol battle. Uh, a protocol battle just as we saw with TCP, TCP IP. Protocol battle that we saw with SMTP for, for email. And in a protocol battle, what matters is not what is best and most elegant, but what can be early to market and achieve a dominant network effect. And the network effect becomes this incredible uh, force that makes it so much incrementally harder for any challengers to really take that, that dominant lead. And so what that, what that portends for the future, though, is that we are all going to be building and expanding on the P2P network protocol uh, that is the, the most pervasive and the, and the most dominant, instead of trying to create another one that's more elegant. Okay, so, so, when, um, so SMTP is the protocol by which we share emails with each other. Correct. And way back when, I, I think there were like 13 different protocols. Or, or more even, yeah. Okay, and by virtue of the fact that SMTP was the protocol that everyone decided to use, that's why... That's why that was the protocol that won. Well, and the same thing is happening with Bitcoin. So there might be a better one, but it's just the fact that Bitcoin is the one that everybody uses. Right, and you can think of it as uh, MOIP, Money Over Internet Protocol, so just like a, a voice over IP. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's at that level. That's what has investors excited about Bitcoin. Um, the other thing that they see is you're able to invest in the cryptocurrency as a proxy for the entire sector. So it's like buying an ETF on the entire sector. You don't have to have, you don't have to take the risk of investing in a solo uh, Bitcoin company with a management team. So by investing in Bitcoin, you are investing in the, the internet. Yes, okay. oh, the future of the yeah. internet. Um, now, you've, you're in, you've said this in public, I believe. While you're very bullish about Bitcoin, you think it's gonna get much bigger, you're less bullish about Ethereum. You think Ethereum would eventually die. Well, we've never seen a cryptocurrency completely die. It has a slow march towards uh, you know, 0 0.0001. But Ethereum has a significant number of challenges ahead of it, and, and I don't think all the investors fully realize this. Um, the, the first challenge is their stated argument uh, to migrate from uh, proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, they haven't articulated a firm timeline for that. Uh, with a th almost a $30 billion market cap in Ethereum, a uh, proof-of-stake uh, consensus system has never been attempted on something so large. Uh, so in my mind, it, it would be foolish to even attempt that. Um, the, the, the second thing that uh, they have going against them is that there's no controlled supply of issuance. Um, whereas Bitcoin will cap out at $21 million, uh, in, in total Bitcoins, Ethereum does not have a similar cap. 
so as an investor, you, you, uh, you have to also understand what the mechanics are behind increasing the amount above uh, whatever the, the given cap is at the time. Uh, and you can read a paper on this. Uh, Ethereum doesn't hide the fact, but it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a process where they, they, they don't have a cap. They exceed the cap. Um, and the third thing is, is a little more nuanced, and it has to do with the smart contract technology and the, the languaging, language uh, behind Ethereum, which is called Solidity. Uh, you know, this is what was largely responsible for uh, the, the explosion in the DAO, the DAO, when we saw the hack of that last year. Um, they, they still cannot deterministically prove that something like the DAO uh, cannot happen again in the future. So, you know, they, they've made some patches, they, they forked Ethereum into Ethereum and Ethereum Classic to roll back that hack, and, and that's what we have with normal Ethereum today. But I, I still maintain that they cannot deterministically prove uh, uh, that it won't happen again in the future. All of these things would, would make me a little bit nervous as a long-term Ethereum holder. Now, we live in London. Uh, our wonderful mayor in London has declared that Uber can no longer operate here. And just before, we, just before we did this interview, we were having lunch, and you just said, well, as soon as Uber starts using Bitcoin, then it won't be an issue. The mayor can't stop it. Tell me about that. Well, our mayor, uh, first of all, probably doesn't care about re-election if this is the stance he's taking. But um, we can solve uh, all of these problems, and Uber can solve all of these problems if they go to a decentralized payment system. Because one of, one of the problems I've always had with Uber from the beginning is that um, uh, you know, they know uh, where they're dropping you off. And then usually it's your home or your work. Um, and then they, they also know your name through your payment system. Now, uh, it, you know, it, uh, that's, that's the first benefit of decentralizing the, is that you won't be able, you won't have to give your name uh, to the Uber company. But he will still know your reputation as a passenger. He'll know your reputation, but he won't be able to match names with addresses. That's not the main problem it solves, though. The main problem that it solves is that you won't have the payment network actually being the weakest link in, in the entire chain. Because right now, um, there's nothing illegal about making an app. It's just an app on your phone. Uh, and, and if two people have an app and they're using it, and one person says, well, I'm, I'm going to swing by that area of the neighborhood, I can pick you up. I mean, that, that's you know, mutual consent via an app. Uh, if, if that's all facilitated uh, through Bitcoin, um, then there, there, there shouldn't even be anything illegal about it. The, the next step further would be to even create a decentralized protocol uh, for matching the Uber driver with the Uber rider. Um, and all kinds of the, these innovations will, will come up if they start cracking down further on, on Uber. So they will lose control of their licensing power effectively as a result. It, it will be rendered irrelevant. The implications the libertarian implications of Bitcoin and, and blockchain and all these cryptocurrencies and the way they are just subverting the power structures in the West is wonderful. Uh, I would say that it's, they are seeking the rent-seeking intermediary in the middle and they are making them irrelevant. Death to the rent seeker. <laughs> John, on that note, thank you very much. If people want to find out more about you and what you do, they should follow you on Twitter. They should subscribe to my Twitter feed. It's a, uh, it's a wealth of, of daily info, and it's uh, at John Matonis. John Matonis, thank you very much. Thanks, Dominic. And thank you very much, folks, for listening and for watching. Please share this show with as many people as possible. Please rate us. Please review us. Please do all the things that you're supposed to, to do, and uh, hopefully stuff that interests me will grow to be as big as the Bitcoin protocol itself. I'm Dominic Frisby. I'll be back with another episode at the same time next week. Thank you very much. Boom, 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 boom.